How's it going, everybody? And welcome to the Music Production Podcast, the show where we talk about all things related to making music. I'm your host, Brian Funk. I'm a musician, Ableton certified trainer and producer from New York. My site is brianfunk.com. And before we get started with the show, I wanted to just tell you about the Music Production Club. The Music Production Club is a subscription service that gets you a steady flow of music production tools in your email inbox. And right now is a very special time. If you join the Music Production Club before the end of 2019, there's a special holiday download set for you. You would get a whole bunch of really cool stuff like a new Korg MS-20 Ableton Live Pack, the Profits of Doom Ableton Live Pack, and the Cassette Tapes Profit Ableton Live Pack. Both of those are made with the Profit 6 analog synthesizer. You would get the Big Layered Synths Ableton Live Pack, which is made with the Profit 8 analog synthesizer. Analog Drums, Ableton Live Pack, which is hundreds of drums run through a Moog sub-fatty analog filter for some added warmth and character. There's Transitions, Noise and FX, Ableton Live Pack, perfect for making smooth transitions between parts of your songs. And then there's also Fat Moog Bass Volume 1 and Volume 2, which are Ableton Live instruments made with the Moog sub-fatty analog synthesizer. On top of that, you also get access to my live performance with Ableton Live video course, a live performance template, all of the free Ableton Live packs in one download, and a an Music Production Club exclusives pack, which contains even more Ableton Live instruments. It's a whole bunch of stuff. And I just started a Discord server for the Music Production Club where we can share ideas, music, ask each other questions. There's homework challenges. We can set up collaborations and so much more. I think it's going to be a really awesome way for us to stay in touch and make the most of this little community. So you can check that out by going to brianfunk.com slash mpc. Okay, so today's episode is called Commit to Committing. Now, I think the entire process of making music is a series of decisions and commitments. You have to decide to start a new track in the first place. You have to decide on the BPM. you got to decide on the key. What is the feeling of your song? What is the mood? What kind of sounds are you going to use? What's the arrangement? What's the genre? Is it going to be a very dense track with lots of stuff going on? Or is it going to be a little more minimalist? What kind of energy will it have? And really, the ultimate decision you'll make is deciding when the song is finished. But we have to make decisions all the way along. And you don't ever get through these stages if you don't make hard and fast decisions. You'll never move forward. It's kind of like life. And this, I guess, you can think of as a metaphor for life, making music. (laughs) But you're never going to get anywhere in your life unless you make difficult decisions and stick to them. You have to decide... Um, who you're going to have relationships with, what job you're going to work, when is it time to leave that job, when is it time to end that relationship, when is it time to move forward in your life, um, to take a chance. And a lot of these choices we have to make in life, we don't get to make again. We don't get to have a do-over, and there's no undo button. In music making, there is an undo button, and we can go back often. And I think this is actually... A big part of our problem because we don't ever commit to things and because we don't have to commit we don't we kind of run around in circles a lot i know i do this all the time and as always um my episodes of this podcast are often just as much reminders to myself as they are you know advice and teachings to anyone else it's, i'm guilty of these things of not doing these things that we'll talk about in this episode but i think it's important to remember And commit to committing is going to be like a new mantra of mine, something that I try to keep in, you know, the front of my head as I'm making music so that I can get things done and enjoy the process more. So I think the real problem of modern music making is too much choice. I've said this before, and the more I think about it, the more I really agree with it. I used to have a four-track cassette recorder, the Tascam Porta Studio MK2. It was called the Meat and Potatoes four-track because it only had the basics. You had four tracks you could record, but you could only do one or two at a time. And uh, you ran out of tracks when you got to four, unless you were creative and you bounced, which, to be honest with you, I don't even remember if that four-track had the feature of bouncing, say, three tracks to the fourth track so you can open up those first three tracks. Which is one of the things we have to we used to have to do in the old days. 
But、um, either way, you're still pretty limited because when you did bounce those three tracks to the fourth track, you were stuck with the way you mixed them. So if your drums are too loud, then they're just too loud for good. So it was a commitment. And then you, of course, had a little bit of sound quality loss. So you couldn't do that over and over again too many times. So there were limitations and that you had to make a decision and stick with it. And it was a lot easier as far as what sounds to use and what genres.、Um, when I had that four track and I was a teenager, I was very into just alternative rock and not much else. So I knew what genre I was going to make all the time. I knew that I was going to record guitar and then vocals. And if I was lucky to have something to bang on for a rhythm, I could do that. But that was really it. So these decisions were made for me. And therefore, I think I went forward a lot faster because I wasn't burdened with all the choice. It got a little experimental and fun. As we started、um, adding effects pedals like a guitar delay or a reverb or distortion to some of our sounds, and that opened up a lot of、uh, possibilities. But we were still really limited. It's not like today where you go in your DAW and you have 17 different delays to choose from, or a bunch of reverbs and all kinds of effects. You know, we had maybe like three different guitar pedals to use and it was fun and it gave us some more possibility but it didn't overwhelm us now i think there's really just too much choice um there's endless samples there's endless vsts and hardware and instruments and now i have so many more possibilities to to explore when i go to make music from The genres I'm interested in is, is much wider than it used to be. And then all the different instruments that I now have, and the almost endless amount of stuff you get just inside your DAW. We have to really deal with this. And there's, there's far too many choices. So we need to eliminate as much of that as possible and commit to things. I think I briefly mentioned a book I read recently called Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz. And I want to bring it up again because this book has been just bouncing around in my head because I think it really has some powerful wisdom. And when you understand what choice does to us and our emotions about what we're doing, I think it makes it a lot easier to commit to things. So, one of the kind of、uh, themes of the book is that although if we have more choices and options, We will more likely get a more appropriate solution to our problem. The problem is, we don't enjoy that solution as much. When you just had, say, your guitar and your four track, you didn't really worry about if you could have recorded a better guitar, if you should have used the other one or the nylon string or the other three electrics you own. You didn't have that problem. You just recorded that as best you could and you moved on. Now, although With, say, more guitars to choose from, you will likely get the better guitar sound. You will also think about the choices you didn't make and the potential of maybe those being a little better or having certain advantages. And because you'll have that in your head, you won't enjoy the sound that you actually got with what would be the better sounding guitar. I think about this a lot when I.、Uh, Go out to eat. I've realized that this is something I do. And I think I may have mentioned this on a previous episode, but、um, <laughs> it's been valuable. When I go out to eat, I don't read the whole menu usually. I pick the first thing and I just go with it. And I'm usually pretty satisfied. I don't really know what I missed out on. And I, I didn't really play out all the possible scenarios in my head. And when I get what I ordered, I eat it and enjoy it mostly. But when I do read the whole menu, then it becomes hard and I start thinking about what I actually want and what I'm going to. It just puts me in a circle of indecision. And then when I actually do get the meal, I wonder if maybe I should have got that other thing that looked pretty good. And what the book is really saying is this you're not going to be as happy with your decisions if you keep considering the alternate decisions you could have made. So we want to try to. Not overthink this too much. We want to move forward instead of looking backwards all the time. 
if you, we can do like a driving analogy, you want to be driving. You don't want to be looking in your rear view mirrors the whole time. The experience of making music should be more like, hey, what's ahead? What's this going to sound like? How's this going to turn out? Like driving, like if you're driving, oh, what's around this turn? Where, where are we going now? Where are we off to? We don't want the experience to be more like, did I make a wrong turn? Have you ever been driving and you're not sure if you're going the right way or if you could have went a better way? And you, you know, you, it takes you out of the moment of enjoying the drive and enjoying what the road has ahead. And I think if our music making experience is always, did I get the right snare? Did I use the best EQ? Did I, should I have put more reverb or a different reverb? Maybe I should go back and try that. If that's your experience, it's not going to be very enjoyable. But if the experience is like, ooh, look, look what's up ahead now. Look what's around the next corner. Oh, this is exciting. That's going to be a lot more fun. We don't want to always second guess everything and kind of keep backtracking. Because again, if you were in a car doing that, you'd keep turning around and then trying something else and then turning around again to try something else and maybe even turning around again to do what you were originally doing in the first place anyway. That's a really frustrating ride. But we want to trust that what we've done is good enough and we don't want to constantly second guess it. So we're not really going for perfection necessarily. We're going for good enough and we get to decide what good enough is. I think we're better off lowering our bar of what good enough is so that we can move forward. Now, this is not to say like you don't want to have a little bit of quality control going on, but don't get obsessed with perfection. Trust yourself, maybe if you think about it this way, trust yourself that you will know what to do with this. Even if it's not the best thing in the world or as perfect as it can be, you will be able to move forward and figure out a way to make it work. So I'm not advocating to just make terrible sounds and music all the time, but I'm also saying don't get obsessed on the other end of the spectrum with perfection. And I will just throw in there that I did a podcast early in the show, one of the first ones actually called Make Bad Music, where I did endorse making bad music only because when you make bad music, you are purposely, like, you're not worried at all if it sounds good. What you're doing is you're just taking yourself through all the steps of the process of beginning a song, finishing a song, all of that stuff. So it is actually a good exercise to make bad music. But that's not what I'm talking about here today. So when I talk about committing, I'm really thinking a lot about um, like MIDI and effects and that I think we should try to print this to audio and commit to it as fast as possible. Now, the problem with, I think, with MIDI, or you could call this the benefit too, but the, I'm going to call it the problem. The problem with MIDI instruments, for instance, is that you can always tweak them. You have the MIDI, which is just the data telling the instrument what to play. And then the instrument, you could turn those knobs forever. You can try different presets. You can experiment with the presets and then alter them. You can even switch out your instrument and try something totally new. And there's this endless you know, op, uh, op set of options for you to just keep changing things. Same thing I would say goes with, if you say you have a chain of effects after a sound. Now you've got, say, a reverb and distortion and, and whatever going on there. You can always tweak those knobs. You can always change them a little. So when you go to make, say, a new part to your song and say it's not fitting just right, you can then go back and think about what you did before and change it and alter it. And then, oh, I'm going to change these effects a little bit. You know, maybe I'll try a different reverb. I'll use a different distortion. I'll use less of it. And now you're doing that thing that we talked about with the car where we said, did I make a wrong turn? And you're going back and you're trying to see if you can find a different way. Instead of focusing on the next sound, if you commit these MIDI instruments or these chains of effects to audio, then you don't really have the option to go fix that stuff. And you have to make the next thing you add to your track fit with what you already have. And think about how many decisions that alleviates you from having to make. Because you now have a sound, you're, let's say, we'll say you're stuck with it, and you have to find something that works with it. Well, if it's, say, a, a bassy sound, you are going to need something maybe that's not so bassy. So that just cut out your whole selection of bass sounds. 
which is great because now that's off the table and you're going to find something that fits and works with it. And this is the experience of the driving metaphor where we're saying, okay, what's next? Where can we go from here? If there's no road to turn down, you can't turn down that road. And if there's no choice for you to put in a basey element, say, you won't pick a basey element. You won't even consider it. And you'll be in this more exploratory mindset. I think it's a much better and much more fun way to be. Now, if you commit things to audio, that does open up some new possibilities for manipulation. You can now chop up the recording. You can't really do that with MIDI. You need to commit it to audio first before you start chopping it and say rearranging it, you, like which is a fun thing to do with say drums. If you have a drum beat, you can chop it up and move things around, create stutters and interesting reverses and stuff. You could stretch out your audio. You can pitch shift your audio. These are things you can't really do with MIDI but they're also now, in a way, new choices. But what I think is good about these choices is they're more like creative solutions, they're creative answers. You're stuck with the sound, it's in audio, but now you're finding ways to be creative with what you have. You're looking for solutions. You're not doing something that's much more passive, like digging through your presets, or trying new sounds, or adding a different plug-in or new VST and all of that kind of stuff. That stuff is more like, I, th I think of that as like passive. It's not really creative. You're just kind of like seeing what you have. But if you have the audio and you're deciding, all right, I'm going to chop this. I'm going to time stretch it. I'm gonna, then, then I'm going to reverse it. Those are creative actions and they're much more fun. They're more enjoyable and it leads to experimentation, not just searching. And I think searching makes you feel like there's something better out there. So you're going to start wondering once you go into searching, like, oh, maybe I should try this. Maybe I should try that. Um, maybe I need something new. And now you find yourself in this uh, gear lust kind of mindset where, and you will find something new. You will find something that seems like it solves your problem. There's a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> There's almost an endless supply of things. So if you get on the internet and start looking around, yeah, you're going to find something that has a solution to what you're trying to do. And you'll probably convince yourself that that is the thing you need. And next thing you know, you find yourself kind of stuck with your project because now you've got it in your head that you need something that you don't already have to move forward. And that's a bad spot to be. And that is the reason why a lot of things get left unfinished. Because now you're going to leave your project behind until you get that new thing. And more often than not, when you come back to the project, you have lost your kind of... Um, energy towards it, you know, you're not in the same mindset and you might decide to just do something new and then that project gets left unfinished. So to wrap this up, we want to commit to committing because that's what really making music is. It's making decisions. It's a series of yes and no's throughout the whole process. Am I going to record with this mic? Yes. Am I going to add this effect? No. Am I going to try this? You're just saying yes and no the whole time. What is the feeling? What am I going to use this genre or that genre? If you can get yourself through those decisions and possibly even eliminate future decisions by making commitments, you're going to get things done faster. And you're going to get used to the process of making decisions and doubling down on them. I know people might critique this and say, well, what happens if I ruin something or what happens if I can't turn back? And this is definitely a legitimate um, concern because you can, you can commit something to the audio and realize you EQ'd it terribly or you compressed all the dynamics out of it and now the sound is a little bit ruined. I would say, though, you don't need to worry about that for two reasons. The first reason, I will say, is that the amount of times that's going to happen is probably so few. And if you compare that to the amount of forward motion you would make by just moving forward and being happy with what you decided and try and moving on to the next stage of the process, you'll get so much more done. You might lose a couple things, maybe a couple gems get lost along the way, but I think in the big picture, you will have created and finished so much more. And I think it's worth maybe a few of your little darlings not coming out quite as you hoped in order to get a larger pool of a body of work. 
The other thing I could say to this, to counter this argument, is that you could always save a version of your project as it is. Do save as, and then make a new file, and then, you know, call that like, you know, whatever you want, before I committed my drums to audio. And this way you can always go back if you need to and bring your MIDI in. I don't love that part of the solution because it still leaves open those um, un settled upon commitments and undecided decisions. But if it makes you feel better, you have it there. The moral though is we are making music by making decisions of what notes to play, what instruments to play them on, what sounds to use. And if we don't make firm commitments, we don't get anything done. So commit to committing. Thanks a lot for listening and have a great day.